Coming to you from our opulent and luxurious 4x8 refurbished broom closet at the National Headquarters in Indianapolis. With duct tape, studio lights, and a mic that you barely can hear, we hope to entertain and educate you. This is the Tango Alpha Lima Podcast. They call me crazy because I'm facing all my giants. They try to scare me into thinking I can't fight it. They tell me I should never even think of trying. But that's just me. I'm going to live out in defiance. Hello, 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 and welcome back to the Tango Alpha Lima podcast. I'm a little more casual today. As you can tell, I am not in the office. I'm at home because our office is closed today. Uh, so if you see me moving around and everything, it's because I'm wearing some Captain America pajamas and a t-shirt. It is spectacular. I am joined, as always, by Jeff Daly of the Michigan Dailies, currently in Hollywood, California, and Ashley Garbulja Moldonado about three blocks from the festivities here recently. So it's good to see you alive and safe and looking as lovely as always. Ashley, oh, how's everything so going? Sweet. So sweet. It's uh, it's good. It's It's been a very turbulent time in DC. Um, I took a walk a few days ago, the labyrinth that is all concrete and fence and almost 25 now thousand National Guard to include my husband. So wild um but very reflective and i'm i'm very hopeful good so good jeff how how's everything with jeff i'm doing great in the time machine back to the inauguration way back yeah. when when uh because this is now in february but um i'm doing great here in california so uh let's get into it man yeah we've got a we've got a good one here today we are going to be joined by navy veteran Naveed Jamali, who was a former double agent for the FBI, who now helps the underserved. Um, child of U.S. immigrants, he joined the military after the 9-11 attacks, calling it the defining moment of my life. Uh, but for three nerve-wracking years, Naveed Jamali spied on America for the Russians, trading cash for thumb drives of sensitive technical data, selling out his own beloved country across noisy restaurant tables and in quiet parking lots. Or so the Russians believed anyway. In fact, he was a secret double agent working closely with the FBI every step of the way. Even though the USSR was no more, for Russia, the Cold War had never ended. The United States was their main enemy. By the time the operation was finished, Jamali and his handlers had cast a bright light on Russian espionage operating out of the Russian mission to the UN in New York. Um, and they had a solid win. So... He is a spectacular individual. He now appears on MSNBC fairly regularly, and I've had the opportunity to see him there. So I'm expecting big things out of this. So without uh, further ado, uh, we'll take a quick commercial break, and we'll be back with Naveed. Delete, delete. If you care about disabled veterans and children in need, and we know you do, donate today to the American Legion Veterans and Children's Foundation. Any amount helps. Donate online at legion.org forward slash donate. All right, and now we are joined by our special guest, Naveed Jamali, uh, who thank you for joining us today. We appreciate you taking time out of your day. I know you were on, uh, we were talking before how you were on MSNBC, and we have a slightly smaller audience, but, uh, you know, I'm sure there's <laughs> a lot of crossover. <laughs> but anyway, all right, Jeff, you're going to start us off here today. Go. All right, we're coming. We're coming for the big network. So uh, you're in on the ground floor, sir. That's right. That's now, I have some questions, but I'm, I'm a little reticent to ask them because I don't know if I can trust anything that you say, <laughs> being <laughs> that you were a double agent. Right. Uh, Fair point. So I'm going to I mean, I'm out in California and I've been in a couple of movies, some you wouldn't want your children to see. <laughs> and uh, but you, sir, have lived You've lived like a movie. I like a double agent thing is is one of the coolest things that I can think of being. And just for to entertain me, can you tell me about anything that may have, you know, gone wrong sure. or would look like put you in danger or or if it's, you know, declassified and stuff by now. And I just said declassified about a double agent on the Tango of Lima podcast. I'm super excited about that. So, you know, just to set the stage, I'm the son of two immigrants. So when I told my parents when this was done that I was a double agent, my parents said, what, you couldn't have been a triple agent? It's not, you could just opt at a double. 
So, of course, like one of the things coming out of this is that you always disappoint. And, and of course, being a father, when my kids found out about this, they were not impressed either. Um, you mentioned uh, MSNBC. I'll, I'll just, before I answer your question, I'll, I'll just share one very quick story to sort of set the stage of, of, again, like who I am and what this stuff means. Years ago, I was in New York City with my kids. We used to live in New York. And this guy comes up to me super excited. He's like, I watch you on TV all the time. Can I have your autograph? And I was like, of course. I'm thinking, wow, I look like the coolest dad ever in front of my kids. And I sign it, and my oldest son, who was nine, nine or ten at the time, turns to me and goes, oh, look, you just met your fan, like completely dead. <laughs> so I just want to set the stage that that's an important part of this is that, you know, a lot of people ask what it was like to be a double agent. And, you know, it really it's important to understand that the enormity of the task was not known to me at the time. And it really was like having a conversation. In my case, I was speaking to a no joke a uh, Russian Navy captain who was uh, assigned to the United Nations. Um, he was, in fact, a GRU, which is Russian military intelligence. And his job was to to vet me and recruit me as as a spy for Russia. So I spent three years essentially being interrogated by, by one guy and working with the FBI to sort of manipulate the Russians. Um, it was intense. There was a lot of moments where you know, just like with anything, whether it's the military or raising kids or just your day to day job, you plan and immediately things go wrong. Um, and it, part of the challenge with that is being able to not just like execute a plan, but being able to adapt in the moment <clears throat> and overcome. And, you know, uh, for whatever reasons, the Russians, when they met with me, um, they always we, all, we met in the US and they had this whole way of sort of setting up meetings. They would give me, we'd meet at these restaurants, they'd give me a menu of the place they wanted to go next, and then randomly they'd call me, and within, you know, an hour or so, I had to go and meet them at this location. And the the comedic part about it is, I don't know if this says something about me, or it says something about them, but they had a real penchant to meet me at Hooters. So <laughs> one of the places that I would... <laughs> I would meet this Russian GRU senior officer is in a Wayne, New Jersey's Hooters. And, you know, the like, just the, I don't know, it was surreal. I mean, that's, that's, the, so when you say it's like a movie, yes, that's right. But it's also, I think we can all relate to it where you're just like, this is ridiculous. How is this really happening? <laughs> Well, what's so, more American than Hooters? Right. So I don't know if the Hooters part is classified or not, but maybe it's declassified now. I don't know if that. Wow. Wow. That's uh, that is awesome. So, yeah, I'm gonna save mine for the second. Everything else, the second round. <laughs> I'm gonna pass it on. That's awesome. All right, Ashley, you are up. So, thank you for being here. Very exciting um, to be with like a real James Bond kind of oh, figure type. You. It's very cool, very archetype. Um, you know, so you're a Navy veteran and you're this. You're the child of U.S. immigrants. I wanted to kind of. Um, you know, peel back some layers and better understand like your story and how these experiences helped you um, take this next, I guess, leap into this larger than life, I guess, Hooters extravaganza, whatever we're going to call it. Sure. So, <laughs> All of these things. You know, um, uh, I'm, a, I'm very much, a, as you said, a child of immigrants, but I'm also a New Yorker. And for me, really... Uh, my condolences. Uh, the, oh, thank you very much. I, I'm guessing you're not a Jets fan. Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, or a Mets fan, or well, anyway, we go, that's a whole yes. The condolences are are very much appreciated in that. Um, but the other thing is that you know, 9/11 for me was this really defining moment. I was this young 20-something year old, and uh, I was working sort of a tech job. And um, when 9/11 happened, I felt very much the urge to do something. And <clears throat> believe it or not, my story. Becoming a double agent started very pedestrian. Like many of my generation, I wanted to join the military. Um, I found this program with the Navy and applied to become an intelligence officer and didn't get in. And I had this really, you know, salt of the earth. It's sort of hard, unbelievable to say it's about a recruiter, but he was actually a pretty decent guy. And he, um, a guy named Lino Covarrubias, we still stay in touch, actually. And um, he was like, look, man, if this is something you really want, you know, you're going to have to do it more than once. And so... Uh, I came up with this idea, you know, the Russians had been coming to my parents ran the small defense contracting company in New York that supplied like West Point, Annapolis um, with books. So like, you know, trading or, or 
uh, the FBI Academy. Like they would just come to them and they would order all their material for for training purposes. And that's what that's what they were. They were this this like small defense contractor firm. Decades ago, the Soviets actually come to their office and start a relationship um, with my parents in terms of getting stuff for them. And the FBI encouraged my parents to keep doing this so that they could keep tabs on the Soviets. When the Soviet Union cr- collapsed, the KGB came back. So it was the same stuff. This idea that the Soviet Union collapsed and the Russian started doing something different is, is BS, right? So it's the same, literally the same thing. So I grew up around this relationship with the Soviets, the Russians, the FBI. And my father, to his credit, really like made it seem like it was a big joke. And so I, I kind of became desensitized to it. So fast forward to 9-11 apply uh, to the Navy, don't get in. And they told me that if I could get some experience, that would help. And so literally, my goal w- was, I went to the FBI and I said, look, I know you're, you have a relationship with my parents and, and the Russians, I'm happy to help. In exchange, do you think you could write me a letter of recommendation? And I just think that, like I envisioned what those two FBI agents must have said when they walked out. You know, usually I'm guessing people come up and say like, I've never paid taxes ever. Can you help me? And here I am asking literally for a letter of recommendation. <laughs> so the, the funny thing, of course, is, as I'm sure you can all relate, is the adventure for me was really becoming a double agent. And you get into the military, and it's all like, you know, well, well, first you have to make sure that you get your DTS vouchers or your, your you know, your H1 or your, your flu shot. Like that was the priority. Right. So, <laughs> right, like it's death by bureaucracy. So it, it was the, the amazing thing about um, – about doing this was was really that was my goal and you talk about you know for me like being the son of two immigrants really wanting to be american the thing that being american defined that i defined as was like military service it was just the most american thing i thought that one could do and so it was really something that drove me and in fact you know three years of doing this was pretty intense and one of the things that i really hung on to was um you know getting that commission and I kind of think back now and I'm like, man, I probably should have aimed higher as than trying to come in as an 01. I should have asked to come in as like an 06 or something. <laughs> but, you know, again, like you're young, you don't you don't think of any you of these things. You don't know what you don't know. No, exactly. That's exactly right. Yeah, I, I'll just go with mine because mine kind of bleeds off that. And I think one of the most interesting things is that, like, I think the career path for most people when they're, you know, little people and they're growing into big people is like, you know, I'm going to go into the military and then I'm going to go be in the CIA and I'm right. going to do all this high speed crap. And you basically went completely the, the opposite way. Like <laughs> you, the only reason you were really a spy was to get into the Navy. Right. So <laughs> focusing mainly on the Navy side, what for I, like, I understand you wanted to serve in, in the military as all of us did, but what, what like, just that you were playing such a high level geopolitical game and then you go to basic training and again, yeah. you have to fill out your, your right. power of attorney and all this, right. other, you That's know, like, right. so like, what was that for you? And and how did you feel when you got into the Navy? Like, were you kind of let down by your experience there or a hundred? So yes and no. Right. I think we can all <laughs> say that there are like some of the worst experiences, but also some of the best experiences, right? Like it's not, yeah. you know, it's just not that clear cut. But you're absolutely right. People ask me like, you know, hey, I want to do this. What's the way to do it? I'm like, do not follow the way I did it. I did it completely <laughs> ass backwards. Yeah. There's a better way to do it. And and you're absolutely right. Look, you know, um, a lot of it, it's like I think about some of the people that I so I left um, and I think about some of the people, my, my friends that are still in that get promoted, for example. And it's like, you know, we were talking about uh, Medal of Honor uh, before. And I think about some of the people who promoted and it's like there's an emphasis on things like you know, literally someone who did a better PowerPoint presentation. It's like the skills that you think you need that advance you are not tied, tethered to reality. And I'm really happy that I got to do what I did with the FBI. It was, you know, it was an absolutely defining moment, really. You know, it wasn't until, honestly, until years later that I realized the enormity of it. You know, you talk about geopolitical. Hey, man, we we called it the circle of trust. Like, it was um, me and... um, you know, uh, two FBI agents and my wife were the only ones who knew what I was doing. And then there was the Russians. So it was really, you know, a really small circle. Fast forward to, you know, getting in the Navy and I have, um, you know, an E4 who comes up to me and goes, hey, sir, I just did my security clearance. And I think I might have run into a problem when they were asking me if I had anything to report. I said, uh, when he was coming back from doing a tour in Gitmo, 
I said, I brought back some Cubans. And the woman was like, the investigator was like, oh, I don't think we have to worry about the cigars. And he said, no, the people. And, and of course, his security <laughs> clearance gets locked up. So like, that was the, <laughs> so you go from this. Wow. Dealing with Russians to, to you know, <laughs> to, yeah. to, to that. And it's just like, um, I wouldn't trade. Like, those were great moments. And, it, you know, the great, great kids, great people, honorable, like, and decent. But there's a lot of BS that you run into. And honestly, you know, when you're working like an operation like this, there's no one else. It's just you. And so you really have this tremendous freedom that I don't think I ever really appreciated it until honestly years yeah. later. Yeah. You know? <laughs> there is something freeing about, I mean, even when you're in a combat zone and it's like, well, you don't have to pay the heating bill. You don't have right. to, you don't have to make sure the garbage is taken out. Like you have your, your thing and it's self-contained and this is all that matters to you is within your, field of view so i think that's a, that's actually a really good point is i think that one of the things that whatever you do whether it's the military or, or anything else in this like those are the moments that i think are really truly you know they leave a mark in that when you really do have true freedom because a lot of the things that we do you have a boss you know you have like you said heating and, and gas bills and you know there are times when you get to do something and it's just uh i it sounds simple to say this, but it's like you're totally mission focused, right? Right. Like it's just this. There's nothing yeah. else that matters. And in a lot of ways, um, you know, and I have to say that for for spouses and, and family, it's the exact opposite. But when you're doing that, it's a very simple life. For everyone yeah. around you, it sucks <laughs> because yeah. of this, right? And I think that that's a really tough thing. The only thing I would disagree with you on to a certain extent is the – the moments in the military that were the worst are to me the best. Like it's <laughs> when the when the suck factor was through the roof, that's the absolute yeah. best memories I have of the military. <laughs> I don't know, man. Mark some is an worst... anomaly. He's yeah. an anomaly. Yeah. Some of the worst moments where it was like, hey, did you get your, you know, your your I mean the shots, like the H1N1. Yeah. I just remember like them losing paperwork and having to get the shot three times. It just things like that. Like I just I compare that to again when we we're doing this and i would say to the fbi can we do this and they look we look at each other and be like why not like yeah. there's any paperwork now just go do it well, let's do it wow. right wow that's awesome mm -hmm. all right well we're going to take a quick commercial break and we'll be right back in a moment with naveed jamali delete delete so you were discharged with a 20 percent disability rating but now you can't hear so well and need help contact an american legion service officer service officers are free of charge and they help all veterans. Find one near you with our online tool at legion.org forward slash service officers. And we are back with Naveed, who I managed to get just as right. he was uh, drinking his Gatorade. <laughs> so it goes. All right, Jeff, you're up for round two, buddy. I'm first again? Yeah. This is exciting. Um, I got confused for a minute because I was going to ask you questions about the Navy. Then you talked about getting a ribbon for PowerPoint, and I thought maybe you're in the Air Force. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, you did it backwards. I'm still going to I'm still going to try to craft this sure. in a, a, a way for uh, people who have done intelligence work in the military and you know want to transfer over and things like that. I assume in your Navy experience, besides the obvious. Besides lying to women at every port <laughs> and pretending to be a good man, what is it about what is it about a military service that prepares people to get into uh, intelligence and especially like clandestine, like the groovy stuff? Like, what is it about the, what is it about being in the military that prepares people for that? You know, at the end of the day, I think we can all agree that one of the biggest things about the military there's a lot of things that we would use as adjectives, adjectives to define it but bureaucracy is definitely one of them, right? And, you know, intelligence work, uh, whether it's clandestine, whether it's covert, whether it's overt, whether you're an analyst, whether you're, you know, you're, you're assigned to an embassy in another country, <clears throat> or frankly, if you're a Russian uh, case officer in New York working with me, you have to generate paperwork. And so one of the things to put that in perspective, like one of the reasons the Russians kept with my family for, for decades was that in many ways they had to produce numbers, right? They had to say, hey, I'm in the United States, I'm talking to assets, here's how many assets I've spoken to, here's how many hours, here's what I got. And so that's paperwork. And as difficult as it is to sound, as this 
to like for people to conceptualize this, you know, if you're an intelligence officer, and again, intelligence officer, intelligence analyst, our job is not to go out there and like actually spy. Rather, the job of an intelligence officer is really to take intelligence from raw intelligence from different sources, whether it's a satellite, whether it's a person, and synthesize it and present it to a commander. And she or he is going to make an, a decision based on intelligence. Our, our job is not to make that decision. So that's really different than being actually someone out that's going out there and collecting stuff. And I think that one of the other challenges, if you're going to go out there and do this, you have to have a sense of humor because it's so like some of the stuff is so ridiculous that if you don't have a sense of humor about it, it's going to literally drive you nuts. I mean, there are things, uh, again, when I was doing this stuff operationally, like I would see a black van and I'm like, I've never seen that black van before. Um, is it the FBI? Is it the Russians? Is it totally random? And literally that could drive you nuts. Like, you, cause there's no way to figure it out. So if you sit there and try to think about it, you're like indecisive. Right. So the goal is to always to. So you have to be able to kind of move on. So military service, I think, prepares you for like, OK, this is ridiculous, but it's not worth <laughs> fighting yeah. for it because you have to move forward. Right. Like you you're going to undoubtedly in your career come across things that are just make little to no sense. And it's just that you just have to do them and not think about it, because if you do. It's like the duck walk and maps. We all did that. Right. Like, what the hell yeah. was the point of that? Mm -hmm. You just have to do it. Um, and I think that that's one of the things is a lot of people don't understand that, look, the intelligence community, there's 17 agencies. It's a huge bureaucracy. You know, the people that actually go and do like the door kicking stuff and, and like the crazy, it's like, it's like a tiny segment of the population. Right. Right. I don't know if you know this Wanda Sykes worked for the NSA, for example, she was logistics person, the no, comedian. Yeah. So you have to have that sense of humor. You have to be able to kind of, you know, churn and, and and not get stuck on the little things. And I mean, isn't that military service too, right? Like, right. It, really is. <laughs> it sounds like you mixed in some hurry up and wait. Yes. Um, yeah, that's exactly yeah. right. <laughs> I mean, well, there's always, there's always one guy that that's like, why are we doing this? And it's like, man, <laughs> I'm going to write a letter and don't, don't tie your brain into a pretzel, bro. This no, is... that's exactly, that's, that's exactly <laughs> right. Like I used to be that NCO. I used to be that NCO. And so after a know. while it wears on you and it you're just does. like, you know what? You just made the you best did, of it. You didn't. You didn't do that until you were an NCO. Like when <laughs> no. Were... I, yeah. No. It really didn't happen until maybe I got into an inline staff sergeant position, and then I was just like, "Well, <laughs> okay then. I, all I, right. I, I started that. At, I started that boot camp. I mean, <laughs> it took me literally <laughs> Day one. thirty seconds. It took me thirty seconds to get off the bus before I whispered to the guy next to me. I think I've made a huge mistake. <laughs> so like I, I started that like boom. <laughs> yeah, intellectual curiosity doesn't really do you any favors no. when there's rampant yeah. stupidity all around you. So all right, <laughs> Ashley, you are up. Listen, so I I just just to carry on on that, I I empathize, I understand, and as a current, you know, government employee, I am constantly trying to keep a sense of humor. And I you did have. notice that you did say circle of trust and that is from meet the Fockers. And I thought that was fantastic. <laughs> reference. So I was like, I wrote that down. You're the Quote. first person who's gotten that. I have to tell yes. you. <laughs> I love my movies. Um, and yes. So I just going back to bureaucracy, like obviously with these layers of bureaucracy and we're kind of, again, peeling back the layers of what, uh, you know, an intelligence analyst did and all of, all of these, what we think are super glamorous positions right. are, are really like, like we take the info, we become the funnel of the info, we don't make the decision. And um, I, I guess during your time, like, if there were solutions to bureaucracy, what would your solutions be given your, you know, different experiences throughout multiple agencies? Like, how would you cut the red tape? Yeah, I, look, I'm going to say it's probably the same thing we all feel is that when you have you know, too many chefs in the kitchen, it just gets convoluted. And one of the biggest issues is that, you know, when you're like at that front line and your view, again, it's this, right? You, you see what you need to do. It's pretty simple. Um, but there's just so many other people above that that are, you know, they're 
trying to weigh in and, and there's power moves. Um, so to put, to put that in perspective, again, talking about the operational stuff, uh, you know, there was a moment the last time I met with my Russian case officer, you know, we sort of, there was a big swarm and I was sort of arrested in front of him and that was the end of the operation. Um, up until that point, I'd only dealt with two FBI agents and their boss. And that was it. That's all I ever knew. And suddenly it's like the State Department is there. There's all these other different agencies that are like swarming and they're trying to tell me how, you know, what you're going to do, where you're going to sit, what you're going to say. And it was, it was too much. And I think that there is, um, you know, I, I think no matter when, what position you're in, sometimes you kind of like for leadership, they just need to sort of back off. Right. Like they just need to let their troops do their job and they know what they're doing. They're capable of doing it. Just let them do it. It's really hard for leaders to do that. I think it's like they can't help themselves. And it's like they end up adding complexity. It's like the good idea fairy. Why don't you do this? Perfect, perfect example. That last meeting that I had with uh, his name was Oleg Kulikov. Um, We, you know, the FBI and the State Department, they they were arguing with the FBI agents about what they could say to him, to Oleg once they arrested me. Could they put their hands on him? Could they talk to him? Could they make eye contact? And it was like this painful, literally weeks of this BS going. Like, I'm not exaggerating. And we plan everything out, right? And so I'm going to meet him, and I walk into the restaurant, and he'd always be inside the restaurant. And I literally put, my, I'll never forget this, put my hand on the door to open it, and I hear, hey, Naveed, and he's coming up this way. And he shakes my hand. As he's shaking my hand, he looks me in the eyes and goes, do you mind if we go somewhere else? And so literally, we've been <laughs> planning for weeks to, <laughs> like, where are people going to sit? And those, like, that, that one sentence threw everything off. And what am I supposed to say? Right. No, no, we have to sit here. Right. So, yeah, right. You know, to answer your question. lunch special. Leadership. <laughs> What's that? The lunch special. You got to tell. I, I live for this lunch Oh, well, you know, these were, these were government employees. The best part about it is the FBI agents who were sitting inside got – had ordered food already and they waited to get it to go and then ran out to the other restaurant. <laughs> and I'm not kidding. With their their dog back because oh they God. had to submit it, right? Like there's <laughs> <laughs> because that's I, government world. Yeah. <laughs> I just as you're telling this, like I have like literally had like many flashbacks of incidents at work where I'm just like, no, no. And <laughs> things can change on a whim. And I think, you know, having as a leader being flexible both yes. resilient and flexible having the sense of humor you're also being a servant leader where again you're like allowing your folks to do their jobs because that's what they're trained to do it just i always kind of i don't know if you're a futurama fan but i always think of hermes sure. conrad and uh i always i always think about him like getting these badges you know what i mean and like just creating yeah. like paperwork and then he would just take it and then put it in the shredder right and it's like I understand you. We're like connecting on a deep level right now. That is just, but uh, that's like, we, we've yes. all been there. It's, it's yes. really hard to be a leader, and and I've never I've never been in this position, but I can imagine it's it must be very hard to be a leader and do the one thing that you're supposed to do in that moment, which is let go. You know, just like not do anything. Yeah. But I think a lot of people I think really it's trust too. Yeah, a lot of it's trust, and it's. And it's weird too, especially now as, as we're moving into a, uh, an administration change. I've I've seen a lot of that, and it's been um, it's been interesting, you know, where there's some folks that are like, well, "All right, let's," you know, it's just another day in the office. And then you have some of your politicals that want to weigh in, or they're leaving, or they're trying to stay, or whatever Gosh. the case may be. And it's like, oh, it's like just just take the bow, go, do what you're gonna do. And it's just, it's fascinating. And I think as leaders, especially moving into, you know, 21st century, like political and like bureaucracy issues is how do we overcome these things? How are we getting, can we get individuals in positions where we then allow people to do the jobs and move forward, reflect, but move forward. And I, I think that's really, um, I think that's really like the modern day challenge for Americans right now. I think now. you're it's right. I'm, it, it's something we've all you know, we've seen the worst and we've seen the best of it, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really, really hard. But it's it's amazing that, you know, that really sets the tone. You can't plan for success, right? No one, whenever we go do something, whatever it is, we're trying to do it to be successful in it. But the reality is that you can't plan things out to the nth degree. There's always going to be that hidden variable that you haven't planned for that that changes. Right. And that's really where leadership just kind of has to cool cool it and it sort of feels like 
I will say this in the in the Zoom era and the pandemic era where everyone wants to we don't have to fly to have meetings, but everyone wants to have, get on a Zoom call. Like I, I can only imagine that it feels like perhaps that may have become worse where you have bosses who you've never seen before checking for updates and oh you know, man the like, micromanaging yeah oh my just God. like this flurry of craziness it's like being back in ohio i always called our weather like powerball weather it was like you never knew what you were gonna get and right. and then it's like hey can you hear me can you see me oh i'm on mute oh sorry oh. and then it's like then they're like giving you this laundry list of things and you're just like that, sound, that sounds yeah, like our pre show. If anything, if anything. <laughs> <laughs> Can you hear me? Can you hear me? <laughs> well, I guess if you're an NCO, you know, I would say, and you've got a bunch of troops out there, like give them a little bit of breathing space. You don't have to do like a check in, a virtual check in twice or three times a day. You know, you, right. like part of it is just treat them a little bit like adults, right? Right. You've got to get to know your troops, too. I always thought that was important. I'm sure you've come across this just in your profession. It's like yeah. building trust with people, understanding strength and, strengths and weaknesses, and how to build a team <laughs> that helps accomplish the mission. And I know it was always, you know, mission always people, et cetera. But I've always said, like, people first and then mission second. Because, like, what happens is, is if you take care of people, you know, they're, they're going to take care of you, sure. right? Just as you said, you don't need to make all those calls. Like, let them... Let them figure it out. Give them opportunity. Give them space. They will surprise you. That's right. I was always a big fan of when the company commander would say, we're going to be in formation at 7, and then the platoon sergeant would say, we're going to be in formation at 6.30, and then the squad leader would be. <laughs> yeah. And then next thing you know, poor Joe yeah. is like, it's 5.15. Why am I standing here? And it's like, well, because everyone above you had to make some modification to feel good about themselves. But anyway, what you uh, Mark, before you do, I wanted to, because I'm tired of actually getting all the movie references. So I have, and I'm in Hollywood, so I have a movie reference. You sounded like it was, you were in office space when he was being interviewed. And he says, I have eight bosses, Bob. Eight. That's right. That means when I, when I mess up, I have eight different people coming to right. tell me about it. Well, so there you go. He also says, I wouldn't say I've missed work, Bob. So they're <laughs> right. like, you've missed a lot of work. So like, I wouldn't say I've missed it. <laughs> <laughs> I celebrate his entire collection. <laughs> <laughs> that the most quotable movie of all time. It's oh, it's without a, a doubt, just a classic, just a classic. <laughs> so, what uh, what's your calling now? I mean, you've done you've done sure. the things that you aimed for, and now you actually have a better idea of what you can do with your life. What uh, what what can we expect in the on the so, horizon? So, right now, I'm I'm uh, I'm a journalist, which of all things, you know. It's it's really weird that I've ended up here. Um, I started off as so when I left uh, when I finished doing, being a double agent and you know joined the uh, the Navy and then I I got signed by MSNBC as an analyst, which was an amazing um, you know amazing sort of foray into media. I'd never done it before, mm -hmm. um, and I think I would say to anyone listening, like I think it's okay to start things and try things that aren't always safe, right? Like it's. You don't know if you try, and I got lucky with that. Um, that kind of kind of springboarded me into actually um, being hired as a journalist for Newsweek, which is what I do now. Cover a lot of uh, national security, intelligence, um, but I still have a, a huge interest in. You know, one of the things, uh, Mark, that I think about. You know, one of the big differences between sort of being in the military and, and being a double agent, right? So, double agent. It's not a career. It's not something you can get right. dental with that you retire with, right? It's got a shelf. <laughs> no dental, <laughs> but, got it. But I think we can all agree that one of the challenges of, you know, there's a lot of people that want to serve in the military, that want to join the intelligence community. And there's always going to be that that pull. But I think the thing that I found that's, that is frustrating is that we can do better once they're in. The idea of mentorship and, like, helping people. Look, for, for me, for example, I know basis of what military service is going to be like, and um, I think that there are a lot of people that come in and in order for them to succeed, it's not enough just getting them past the hurdle of getting in, making it through boot camp or whatever, but like need to be committed to their success in the organization. Um, you know, when I look at, uh, the chiefs now, and you know, I think out of the 42 four star generals, we have three or four that are black. Mm -hmm. And it's not that I, I think that that's a problem for the four star generals who are there. They, they deserve it. But we need to do better to encourage people, not that once they get in, to go forward. So I'm hoping to, you know, continue to, to, to help in that in a mentorship capacity. Um, you know, I, I feel strongly in the intelligence community that we need 
that same sort of mentorship and to help people, like I said, once they're in, succeed and be committed to sticking with it. Because, look, this country benefits when people stay in, right? That's talent that we lo- not just getting it in there. We don't want to lose it. We're right. better when we have good people, as, as Ashley was saying. So my calling is while I'm still a journalist, I still very much this is a problem that I want to work, want to help with. And, you know, I'm hopeful that, uh, you know, that there's an opportunity to do so. If you write a book, sir, can we please get it for the American Legion? We need the same sort of thing. Like we do. We need. You already wrote a book, didn't you? Yeah, I did. Yeah. But, but I am working on a second book. So, I mean, we are. Yes. I mean, yeah. but that point is, look, and again, it's I think one of the challenges talking about like the, the Legion, for example, um, or any organizations that we have to acknowledge that there is a lack of diversity, whether it's gender, whether it's, you know, uh, ethnicity or, or anything at the top. But that doesn't mean that we should say that the people that are there aren't deserving those positions or, you know, didn't work damn hard to get there. And I think that, you know, both kind of have to go hand in hand. But it, it, look, there's got to be a change. I mean, there's got to be mm. a reflection of the country. Um, and, you know, I, I think that we have to have an open discussion about this. And, and, and honestly, it's one of the reasons why I did this. You know, I wanted to come on your show is that I think it's a really important message to get out there that things are changing. Look, you know, I'm sure you think about your own military service and the people that were in there and the diversity at, 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 the, at certain levels that was there. Right. I mean, it really is. Why is that diversity? And this is the same thing with you go to you know, any Fortune 50 company. Right. Why is there diversity at, a, at some level? But then the higher you get up, right. it, it drops. Not... Yeah. Hmm. Well, I, I appreciated that mentorship thing and the even the talent drain, uh, inclusive of diversity and just exclusive of diversity uh, we find in the post the most the hard charge and go-getters end up getting positions at district and leave their their posts with a, a talent gap and you know you keep going and going and going and uh, and i feel like i'm getting a subtle call out because i need to find and uh, nurture people that want to serve uh my post and district, whatever, in meaningful, impactful ways. So thanks for calling me out covertly. See, I see what you did there. <laughs> Can I just say one thing? So I had a really, really fascinating conversation with a gentleman uh, who's a Navy SEAL. And, um, you know, he was telling me that he started a program for um, midshipmen in Annapolis. And what they found is that I, he was telling me that the, the graduation rate in Annapolis is like 60 or so percent. It's, 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 look, it's a tough place in any of these academies to graduate. Um, but what he found is that with their mentorship, with their mentorship program, their graduation rate was like 85, 90 yeah. percent. Not only was the graduation rate higher, but he was telling me that, like, you know, um, they've it, in the five or I can't remember, maybe it's been a decade they've had around. Um, but they've like welcomed, you know, destroyer captains, people who've made, you know, from this mentorship that have made 06. So it's not just about getting through the academy. It's that it sets them up for life. And I think that's the. You know, we think about the the legion like these are things that values that i really feel we can encourage it's not just about like hey you know it's one thing to get them in there and get them to sign that document and 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 to be sworn in it's another thing to make sure that they're successful once they're in and there's nothing about military service that says you can't do that right that doesn't change being a hard ass or, or put, being a you know gung-ho why wouldn't you want people to succeed right it's it's in our it's in everyone's advantage for good people to succeed well, thanks to Jeff saying you should write a book and then Holly calling him out with uh, I, I could tell you that I have, as I, as you were talking, I've already purchased on Audible, oh, How to Catch nice. a Russian Spy, The True Story of an American Civilian Turned Double Agent. So, uh, yes, it is available on Amazon. So I will be uh, listening to that shortly. I, I'm just going to say, like, I don't want to call anyone out, but there is someone wearing a red shirt who didn't prepare for this interview. Well, we don't want to talk about it. We don't want to talk about it. I I got interrupted and told my question. (laughs) As you you can see what I deal with. It wasn't your question. I got interrupted in the middle of my question because I was saying I wanted him to write a book about mentorship and how it affects organization but as soon as i said read a book you jumped in no you did write a book it was a good say it was a good say just, just i didn't ask my question i'm the victim marine here we're gonna we're gonna bypass two things the first of which is it wasn't his question and second of all, 
Second of all, your bio was literally two paragraphs. So that would have taken <laughs> Jeff at least a day or two to get through it. So it, I will listen. If it makes you feel better, I'll write one in crayon and send it to you. Exactly. There you go. <laughs> Make sure it's red. Um, That's red. And right. I appreciate I appreciate all the rides too. So. <laughs> send send the nubs of the crayons with it. He might get hungry while he's reading it. <laughs> so super, super duper random fun facts. So January is actually mentorship month, national oh. mentor. So I don't know. I just thought about that. Snap a fact, throw it in the basket. It's January's mentorship month. Can we all agree that after, you know, listen, whatever your political affiliations are, I mean, it's, it's up to us, this generation to really encourage the next generation to serve. It is an right. honorable profession. It's a good profession. I mean, I know we joke about it, that there's a lot of BS, but you know, I really feel like this is something that, you know, this generation of veterans should be out there doing. But we also should make sure that the people that we do encourage to do it are taken care of. So it's a, it's a double. Like we should demand our legislators and, you know, commander in chief, like VA, everyone, you know, we there's nothing wrong with saying we can do a better job. Again, it's not saying someone is doing a bad job, but we can hold people to a standard because they sure as hell hold the people who are wearing, you know, this country's uniform today to a standard. And I think it's only fair that it's received. Absolutely. Absolutely. I concur. All right, Naveed, thank you so much for joining us. And we will take our second commercial break and then we'll be out of here. But again, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate you taking your time. So uh, I think the big news out of this is that Russian agents uh, like to go to Hooters. It's That's your main takeaway out of all of that? All of that. I, I'm, I'm not on. the mentorship, the circle of trust, but Hooters. I mean, hey, like, look, the mentorship long term, yes, but right now I'm still flummoxed by the fact that Russian agents choose Hooters as their place to do business. They do have really good chicken wings. Okay. Clearly, Oops. yeah, clearly you've not had the spicy garlic because that will bring down nations. Will, I don't think I don't we know. have a Hooters here <laughs> in Indiana. Flavor. I I don't know. I I haven't been to a super producer. Holly is nodding vigorously yes we do i don't know if that's uh her weekend job or what but i have not been to a hooters in eons i think it, but i it just you know you would think that all this high level spy stuff would go down in a cd bar or a nice steakhouse or something no it's yeah it's you think hooters. like it's smooth and sexy and it's like shaken not stirred it's yeah like, like no like yeah, are like spicy chicken wings. Can I get a dozen right here? Thank right. you. Right. Do, do you have that plan to that base that we were talking about? Also, look at that girl in the orange shorts. Like, <laughs> it's, it seems a, a very odd segue, but man, he's uh, he's an interesting cat. And yeah, uh, absolutely. I, I am uh, very much looking forward to uh, listening to his book. I don't know if that'll happen today since I'm about seven books deep. But Jeff, what was your main takeaway? I, I I really liked his take on things we can do to improve organizations, uh, not just military, not just government. I think the I think the mentorship stuff kind of resonates everywhere. Uh, I think the the uh, getting rid of bureaucratic litter everywhere is a universal language. It's not just government. Every fortune, yeah. probably two thousand company has a million pieces of bureaucracy in the way of getting things done efficiently. So I, I, I like hearing that and I like uh, that it's going to our audience so that so that we can uh, so that we can streamline this organization and make it really uh, uh, have strong appeal towards the people we'd love to help join us and help us really be a strong voice for veterans still serving uh, in this country. Yeah, I think I think it's overstating it that there's a reticence within the American Legion nationally to have new leaders and stuff. It's just it's it's new to them. Like the, there's a lot of times, you know, but they are certainly making their the, the roads out there. I mean, this podcast is a perfect example. They kind of they took a, a flyer on us to because they don't know what we're going to talk about every week. Um, and so far, our, you know, I haven't. Not once have I been called into the national adjutant's <laughs> office asking what the hell I was doing. So I guess right. everything's okay, you know. So yeah, I think I think that you know every organization goes through these these mm -hmm. time frames, and it's always in between wars because when you're doing the war, you know, 
But just like the World War II generation handed it off to the Korean, Korean handed it off to Vietnam, and now it's it's starting to be us that's coming into power. And the big thing is that we need to, like I said, just keep mentoring people below us and try to bring them along. You know, everybody's in the same the same basket, if you will. So it's about setting the example and being the example to follow. Yeah. And I think his message of both di- both diversity, inclusive, understanding that the folks that are there have worked really hard, but we need to help lift others into positions where they can continue to make a difference. And that's where that mentorship piece really comes where, comes into hand regardless, as Jeff said, whether you're in a bureauc- bureaucracy, a government agency, right, to a mom and pop organization, to wherever you are, like holding those principles first and like making sure that we're taking care of people, putting people first is really um, what we need to do to, to cultivate a challenge and continue to grow. I agree. All right, folks. Well, that will do it for uh, do it for us today anyway, and we will see you back here next week. Bye. Bye.